Welcome to Adventures with a Very Small Lathe. It's six months since I started this project, so it's probably a good time for a summary of what I've done so far and a proper explanation of what the tool is for. Here's the CAD model for the work I've done so far. I machined it as two separate parts and fastened them together in the last episode. The spindle and mount were machined from a single piece of engineering steel and caused me some of the biggest challenges of the project so far. The combined weight of the large piece of stock and the forge or chuck on the small lathe caused a lot of chatter. The face plate itself was machined from a piece of 42 CRM04, an engineering steel similar to 4140. The slots in the face were the most difficult operations and the source of most of the mistakes. Fortunately I was able to recover by adapting the design a little. The features to attach the two parts together were completed in the most recent video, drilling and tapping three screw holes. Eventually I'll make custom screws for this fitting, but for now I'm using standard cap screws. The mount is designed to attach to the proxon lathe spindle in place of the chuck. It uses four screw holes rather than three to get the best possible rigidity. The plate then screws in place on the end of the spindle mount. Let's take a closer look at how a watchmaker's faceplate is used. The faceplate will be used to turn large watch parts, like the main plate shown here. Most parts in a watch fit into holes machined into the main plate and are held in place by a bridge screwed in place over the parts. The stock for the main plate needs to be mounted a few millimeters away from the plate, with the feature to be machined centered at the axis of rotation. The faceplate includes three clamps to do this, one installed in each of the slots. To ensure that the plate can be held without damaging any of the features, the stock is cut to a shape which includes flanges to clamp the part. The flanges are shown in a slightly different colour here to highlight the shape, but are part of the single piece of stock cut out to make the watch part. The clamps are moved to suitable positions and then tightened to grasp the flanges firmly. With the part held firmly in three points, it can be turned on the lathe and the required features can be machined into the plate. To machine the next feature, the part is moved to a new location and the clamps adjusted to hold it, once again avoiding any pressure on the features of the plate itself by clamping on the flanges. Let's take a closer look at how these clamps could be made. The design is strongly inspired by the faceplate clamps for my Bowley watchmaker's lathe. The two jaws are anchored around a central shaft which keeps them aligned and controls the spacing. The second shaft is threaded into the back of the lower jaw and serves two purposes. It both keeps both jaws in the same orientation and ensures the jaws remain parallel when tightened. The thumb wheel on the second shaft is used to set the clamping depth. The counterbore in the lower jaw contains a spring to hold the jaws apart. The central shaft is held against the spring by a thumb operated screw behind the faceplate with a spacer washer to allow it to be turned freely. These are the six parts I needed to make to prototype this design. The two jaws seem easiest to make from brass and the other parts would be easy to turn from silver steel. For the rest of this episode I'm going to show the machining to make the two brass jaws. I started by machining the end of the 25mm brass bar stock flat.
face the end of the stock before each cut because it makes it easier to square the part in a vise. Firstly I squared the top of the lower jaw to clean up the bandsaw cut and brought it roughly to size. I then cleaned up the opposite face to remove the side milling tool marks and bring it to final dimension. The same procedure for the top jaw, but the setup was a little more tricky as there's less meat to hold in the vise. I face the sides of the jaws with the two parts clumped together in the vise, an easy way to ensure they remain the same size.
faced the ends I used a large parallel pressed against the side of the vise to ensure the parts were true. Once again I faced the two jaws at the same time. The vice jaw load is way off centre but this didn't seem to cause a problem. Both jaws have been squared up and machined to size, ready for drilling and boring. I used an edge finder to find the side and back faces of the fixed jaw to use as reference for the rest of the operations. I don't have a DRO or long dial indicator, so I had to depend on the wheel scales for dimensions. A parallel pressed firmly against the fixed jaw ensured that the edge of the part was aligned with my reference. The first operation is the alignment hole at the back of the top jaw. I mark the location very carefully with a spotting drill before checking the dimensions. With the dimension confirmed, I locked the table before drilling the hole. This hole needs a smooth accurate bore, so I used a reamer to bring it to its 3mm final dimension. With the table still locked in the same position, I set up the lower jaw to drill the equivalent tapped hole through the aligning thumb screw. This was an ideal job for my recent shop made tap follower, especially as this M3 tap requires the specially made narrow tool tip.
Once the tapped hole was complete, I unlocked the table, moved to the location of the central bore, and locked the table again. Drilling the central hole presented a challenge. The 6mm hole was too wide to be drilled between 4mm parallels, so I couldn't use them to support the part as usual. At this extreme end of the vice jaw I couldn't be certain of getting enough clamping force to support the part against the drilling force either, so I had to compromise. I squeezed the ends of the parallels under the ends of the part, which at the back requires the parallel to be at an awkward angle to avoid the machine column. Unfortunately, the rear parallel wasn't quite as clear as I thought. Luckily, I don't seem to have damaged either the parallel or the twist drill. The table is still locked as I switch to the other jaw to drill the equivalent hole. Lesson unlearned, I used the same arrangement with the parallels. Both holes needed to be reamed to final dimension. I used an 8mm end mill to counterbore the top jaw. The same 8mm end mill was also a suitable size for the spring housing in the lower jaw. The boring was very slow as the tool tended to grab if significant pressure was applied. The final counterbore was the housing for the thumb wheel at the back of the lower jaw. 
I used a center finder to relocate the hole as the mill column had been moved in the meantime and my reference table position was no longer useful. The tool tended to grab even more than before, probably because the cut is somewhat intermittent, as the circumference is intentionally partly outside the part. The critical geometry of these two parts is now complete. I haven't yet made a final decision about the outside shape, but that doesn't matter much at this point. The next episode will be making the four steel parts that align the jaws, hold them together and allow them to clamp parts. <laughs>